Welcome to Fun with Annuities with your host, me, Stan the Annuity Man, America's annuity agent. Can annuities be fun? Can contractual guarantees be fun? Absolutely they can. Find out the brutal facts about annuities with no sales pitches or high pressure nonsense. Just the brutal and factual annuity truth, which is all you need to hear. Let's have some fun with annuities and let's have that fun start right now. Welcome to Fun with Annuities. I'm your host, Stan the Annuity Man, America's annuity agent, licensed in all 50 states. Welcome to everyone on all the podcast platforms. Thank you so much for joining us. And also on the Fun with Annuities YouTube channel where we're filming this, watch uh, me and uh, the guest of honor, who I'm getting ready to introduce in a second. You can see our facial expressions and the laughs and all that good stuff. So you can do that. Also a reminder, I do have another YouTube channel called Stan the Annuity Man, which has over uh, 300 and I guess 350 videos on annuity topics. And you can go to my site at theannuityman.com for quotes and books and all that stuff. So without further ado, let me introduce our guest of honor. And, and really, to be very honest with you, this is financial royalty. Now she might not agree with that. She might agree with that. She should agree with that. So here, here's who's on today's podcast. If you can believe that we have her on. Her name is Terry Savage. She's known as the money lady. And she's a nationally recognized expert on personal finance, the economy and the markets. And she writes a, a weekly personal finance column and, and it's syndicated in all major newspapers and it's distributed by the Tribune Content Agency, which is the big boys. Um, she, she's also the author of four best selling books on personal finance. Her latest one is fantastic. It's called The Savage Truth on Money. It's available on Amazon and her website, which is terrysavage.com. She appears on, I mean, she was on, she emailed me this morning that she was on air at like six in the morning. She's on national television, radio programs, um, and she comments on financial markets and, and current economic events. And she's featured on WGN Radio and WGN TV in Chicago with her weekly personal finance segment. But I'm going to save the best for last for her, and then we're going to get to it. She started her career as a stockbroker and became a founding member and the first woman trader on the Chicago Board Options Exchange. She was also a member of the Chicago Mer Mercantile Exchange and their international monetary market where she traded interest rate futures and currencies. She now serves on the board of directors of the CME Group, the parent company of the Chicago Mercantile Exchange. She's also served on the boards of McDonald's and Pennzoil. Hello. Now, just to pile on just a little bit more with her credentials, go to her site. She has a newsletter. She has a podcast called Friends with Money. There's so much more. That's terrysavage.com. Without further ado, welcome to Fun with Annuities, Terry Savage. Oh, Stan, what an intro. If my mother were alive, I would have thought she wrote it. You got everything in there. And the older you get, the longer your, your bio grows. So thank you for that very generous intro. I did not get to half of it for the, for the viewers and listeners. So let's jump right into uh, okay. the topics. Um, I would love to hear your opinion on current markets right now and just the market environment in this supposed raging bull market. What's your gut feel telling you? Well, uh, first of all, let's, let's understand one thing. If I were the world's greatest trader, you know I had my entree there opening day on the CBOE. Right. And I think that I am a better long-term investor than I am a trader. Okay. So we have to start with my overall philosophy. Uh, we've had some volatility in recent days. Definitely. But when you think about it, the market is at or about or very near its all-time highs. Right. So if you just put a couple thousand dollars a year in your IRA every year, for the last 50 years since they were invented and in the S&P 500, you'd have a million and a half dollars just like that. I mean, the details are in my book, but the point is you, either, you don't have to beat the market to be very successful. You have to be the market because over the past 90 years, this is Ibbotson market historians, mm -hmm. there's never been a 20 year period where you would have lost money in a diversified portfolio of large company stocks with dividends reinvested, that's a key component, never lost money even adjusted for inflation. So whether you take 1929 to 49 or 52 to 72, any 20 year period, it's always, the market has always been inflation. So over the long run, 
I think, I know, not your sophisticated podcast viewers, but most people who have that 401k opportunity, they're going to do just fine. You're betting on America, like Warren Buffett says. Nobody ever got rich betting against America. In yeah. that context, we can talk about what's going on now. But okay. you, I believe you need a long-term perspective. And, and history proves that to be correct. And by the way, if you go to Terry's site, terrysavage.com, there's an inter video interview of her interviewing Warren Buffett. So she doesn't just drop his name casually. She knows him. <laughs> I mean, that's who Terry is. Um, so you're in essence saying, you know, stop watching the game, get in, get in the game, correct? You have to be there. You don't have to beat the market. You have to be the market. That's for starters. Now, I am not, despite the fact that I've been around an old fuddy-duddy, I love but we've got a whole generation just getting in the market. They're going to learn their lesson because the market is always right. And they're going to get some expensive lessons learned to them. I always say it's better to learn when you're young mm -hmm. because then you have time to fix your mistakes over the long run. Correct. So I'm thrilled about Robin Hood people. I'm thrilled about the fact that they think they can push the market around. You know, my experience, the market is always right. The lessons that cost the most, teach the most, and better to start when you're young. Now, we're coming out of this pandemic. The market's been soaring. The economy is soaring. We know inflation is picking up. And the big question is, can one man, Fed Chairman Jay Powell, control inflation and interest rates? He tells us, hey, don't worry. It's, quote, transitory. That's like the buzzword of the year, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, and that... Just, it's these adjustments. Sure, lumber is up 300%, but that's only because you all decided to do housing projects and build new houses And just, when you were in the pandemic. You know, you want to make an addition because you're squashed in your house. And yeah, used car prices are up 70%, but that's because, well, you didn't want to take public transport. You want to buy a car. And by the way, there aren't enough chips in the world for the car manufacturers to keep. So this is all transitory, he says. Well, we're going to see because a lot of people don't want to go back to work or can't go back to work because they don't have childcare. And what's gonna entice them back for all these unfilled jobs in the hotels and the food service industry? Higher wages. So excuse me, but I lived through the 70s and the inflation of the early 80s. And they, we, there's a word that's gonna come up, wage price spiral. To get people back to work, wages will go up, prices will go up to offset those wages. And I have never believed that one person, even a person as powerful as the Fed chairman, could control the markets. And we're about to have a test of that. Interest rates. I mean, everybody for the last six years has called Stan the annuity man and said, interest rates have to go up, Stan. <laughs> and I'm like, they don't really. And when you compare interest rates, the 10-year treasury to equivalents across the world, 10-year treasury equivalents, we're still at a relatively high level, even though me and you remember Jimmy Carter interest rates. No one can predict interest rate movements but can you talk about the, the corner that, that the Fed has painted themselves into with all of this printing of money and then interest? I mean, this is, this is a tough one. What do you think? Okay. So just a quick history lesson. Interest rates go up and went up in 1979 because people look, you know, we had a decade in the 70s. Sorry if this is ancient history to all of you, but, you know, they say those who don't remember history are doomed to repeat it. Well, in the 70s, we had a long period of fighting the Vietnam War first, and then there was a Lyndon Johnson Great Society thing that came through. And we had the OPEC oil crisis, so they printed more money so the economy wouldn't be crunched by higher oil prices. So throughout a decade, they printed money. And by the end of the decade, people looked around and said, excuse me, there's a lot of money out here. It's pushing prices up. I think if I'm going to lend my money in a bank deposit or in a business, I'm going to demand a higher interest rate to offset the declining value of what I get back because of inflation. It took a decade really for that to build up. Rates moved up and then Paul Volcker came in and said, I'm going to tell you there is not going to be any more inflation, even if I have to throw this economy into a recession. And he pushed the prime rate to 21% and we had a recession and they tried to recover and he pushed rates up again. And everybody said, okay, inflation is dead. And we haven't thought about it for 40 years. Okay. Now we live in a much more fast paced society. The entire world knows weekly. By then, the Fed, they used to put out their minutes of their meetings a month later. You never got a press conference after the Fed meeting, okay? We're in instantaneous times now. We know that over the last couple of years, $7 trillion 
in new debt, new liquidity has been pumped into the economy. The national debt is $28 trillion. Right. The Fed's buying $120 billion of it every week because the Treasury sells the IOUs and the Fed buys it with newly created liquidity. And that's what's going on in the stock market and in the jobs market and in the lumber market and every other market. So the question is, right now the U.S., as you correctly pointed out, is the least worst place in the world to put your money. I mean, think about what your alternatives are. That's a great t-shirt, least worst. It's the least worst place. I mean, you know, I mean, would, you, would you rather be in Sterling? No, I mean, who knows what Brexit's gonna do? Well, how right. about Euroland? They're still closed down. Right. Japan, excuse me, they're aging, so are we, but they're in trouble. I mean, China, oh, I don't know, it's the Roche Motel, you put it in, could you get it out? So, <laughs> so not only investors, but central banks around the world invest in treasury bills, notes, and bonds, they buy our IOUs. Now, the Fed's been very successful in holding rates low, much to the chagrin of everybody who's a saver out there. You see yeah. these paying a quarter of a percent, maybe. Treasury bills, you know, three-eighths of a percent. One day, however, the world's gonna look around, the central banks, and go, wait a minute. You're gonna have to pay us higher interest rates because look at all the money you're printing. It's watering the milk, it's, it's getting worthless sidebar story here you probably this makes a big impression on me at only three percent inflation the value the spending power of your money is cut in half in less than 25 years mm -hmm. it's called the rule of 72 look it up so it's an insidious creeping process if you retire at 65 today and you say well i'm going to get a check a month for life in my annuity immediate annuity i'm 65 and i'll have $4,812 looks fine with my social security, I'll be fine. Well, in 25 years, and you'll probably be alive, 65, 75, 85, 90, mm -hmm. that's, you know, where you can, that'll buy half as much as it did today, at only 3% inflation. And with all this money being created, and with the attention of the world being focused on this, any moment that explosion could go off where the world says, pay us more in interest to buy your debt. And then, the U.S. budget deficit explodes because interest is now the third largest category of spending at very low rates with all this debt. And they have to refinance those, those IOUs as they come due every six months or one year or 10 right. years. The rates will be higher. The cost will dwarf everything we spend on infrastructure or social programs. So there's just, I mean, interest rates will have to eventually inch up in your opinion. Is that what I'm hearing from you? Well, at the beginning of this year, uh, in all the media that I'm on, I said, the one thing you must do in January, it's only like four and a half months ago or so, mm -hmm. I said, the one thing you must do is refinance your mortgage right now at rates that were then under three and a half percent. Or nearly, I was the person who said, and pay off your mortgage by the time you retire. Uh-uh. I said, three, three and a quarter, three and a half percent, you're going to look on that fixed rate loan for 25, 30 years and go, that was the best thing I ever did because yeah. I think it's inevitable that rates will go up. And moreover, I think when it happens, it's gonna happen like that. We've been nudging around the 10 year, 10 sure. year yield at one point, close to 1.7% has already, a year ago in April, it was 0.5%, so it's tripled. We don't notice that. You know, the banks aren't paying you more, but the rates mm -hmm. of the mortgage are going up already. And, and side note, you know, that's the reason that we sell a ton of multi-year guarantee annuities, which is the annuity industry version of a CD that gets, you know, a 3% on a, on a five-year and two and a quarter on a, on a three-year at the time of this taping. So if you're listening to this down the road, look at the time of this taping. But the point of the matter is those are the best rates on the planet just because life insurance companies have a dynamic pricing model and they're not just hinged to the tenure. But I do think that um, the Fed has painted themselves into a corner in a corner that we've never seen. Blue water strategy is what I call it, which is we've never seen them print $7 trillion. So, you know, we have a lot of, of, of years and decades in the business, but both of us are watching it and going, wow, this is different. What's gonna happen? How are they gonna handle this? We're in a global market where everything's connected. You know, when, when me and you started in the business back in the day, you know, we put in our tickets through a vacuum tube. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yeah. So that's how long, that's how long I'm we have. I'm trying to pretend I'm 35. Okay. There you go. Um, which leads me to a topic that I've been dying to get your opinion on 
one-on-one and with my listeners, and they're all leaning in right now, is cryptocurrency. Um, I, I read what Warren Buffett said. I, I read what uh, what uh, Bill Ackerman said, I think, the other day about it just having no intrinsic value. <laughs> you know, recently. Um, uh, the, wait, wait. Do you think the dollar has any intrinsic value? Great point. It is a full faith and credit of the United States. If your nephew came to you for a loan and he was already head over heels in debt, far more than he could ever earn in his lifetime, right. would you make him a loan? Because his full faith and credit as a deadbeat is pretty obvious. Now, I'm going to be very <laughs> careful how I say this, but you know, what's the intrinsic? And we can't exchange it for gold anymore. So what's the intrinsic Correct. value of the dollar or the yen or the euro? So your opinion on crypto is it's, it falls into the same category because this no. is new. Where, where's this land in your world? Well, I've been following this for a while. Ask me if I bought any, no, because when I first started following it a couple of years ago, actually I thought, and I'm gonna put my money in this thing that's not an exchange and it's not a bank and I get to make it significant. And you know, at the time it was like $800. So don't, I told you I'm not a good trader. Um, <laughs> and I said, but how will I ever get it out? I mean, where will I get it out? What if I forget? I forget my pins a lot of times. You heard those horror stories about the guy right. couldn't remember and it's okay. But basically let's back up. Before crypto, there's blockchain. And blockchain is a technology that is gonna revolutionize the world. Agreed. Now, whether it comes through cryptocurrencies or central bank digital currencies, I'll come back to that. But you have to understand that we don't live in a world of paper. I remember as a TV reporter doing stories about the helicopter landing on top of the Federal Reserve Bank in downtown Chicago, moving the paper checks. And you may remember, if you're young, you're going to think I'm an old fogey talking about horse and buggies. But the fact is, you couldn't get your money cleared for two days if it was mm -hmm. a check on another bank in Chicago. And they could hold your money for five business days if someone sent you a check from California. Because right. it was paper. And that seems ridiculous. I think within a couple of years, the idea of T plus two settlement, you know, your stock price, your trades don't settle in instantaneously, that'll be gone. I think you won't need to do title searches to prove the property title is intact because that can all be encrypted using blockchain ledger. Right. And don't take my word for it. Everybody from Visa to every central bank in the world is working on a new way of handling transactions, I'll make up that word, using blockchain ledger. It's immutable. It can't be changed unless it follows certain protocols. Yeah, ask Elon Musk, it takes a whole lot of energy to mine. That's another story, go Google that, that's a different story. That's an interesting that, story. They're pulling away from that yeah. because of the environmental issues yeah. of, of the energy being used to create Bitcoin. Interesting. The energy being used to generate the computing yeah. power that's needed. But, let, but yes, let, let's stick to personal finance. Sure. I know that we will have a digital currency, I would suspect within the next five to seven years. And Bitcoin, remember, is off the grid of central banks and, and government controls. So that's a Ethereum, Bitcoin, Dogecoin, whatever. Yeah, I mean, whatever. you know, it always reminds me of having to clean up after my puppy when they say, <laughs> okay. okay. But I, I don't know what's gonna happen with those. I don't know what's going to happen with the pricing of those because those don't have an intrinsic value, but I don't know what's going to happen to the value of the dollar either. But I'm absolutely dead sure that we will be transformed into an instantaneous, you know, I want to pay you something. I, I once said I could FedEx you a check overnight. I could get a certified check. I mean, not so long ago, and I could FedEx it to you. Would you hold that for me? Mm -hmm. And now the woman said, do you have do square? Bingo or do Venmo, bingo. So we've moved so far in the last three or four years. And I think the next five years we'll see um, completely, the, 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 the system of payments will be completely changed by blockchain ledger. I don't want to know if I could pick a winner between Bitcoin and Ethereum or a central bank currency they have yet to announce. Well, you remember, we, we both remember when the internet got going, okay? Yes. Um, we remember the yeah, internet. A AOL and MySpace were the leaders. And I've said from the start that there's absolutely no way that the government and the five largest banks aren't going to be playing big time in this, in this world 
Um, and, and it wouldn't surprise me if the government in, in conjunction with the large banks came out and said, you know what, we don't recognize Bitcoin anymore. We, you know, we have XYZ coin or USA coin or whatever they want to call it. I think that's probably the better bet because from a tracking standpoint and a taxation standpoint, April 15th might be gone. In the future, it might be real time taxes um, because of the blockchain technology that you mentioned. Do you agree that's a with real good point? Yeah, Stan, I never thought of that. Do you agree with that type? I think, I think we're in, again, going back to blue water. I think that's a blue water thought. Blockchain changes the game. And, um, you know, I've had conversations with, with good friends that are in the investment advisory business. And my, my question is, f forget the, the cryptocurrency. Are you investing in companies that are investing in blockchain? And they say, yes, yeah, that's, done, that's the future. Do you agree I've with done, that? Yes, I've done that. But okay. I, I, I just beg to differ with one thing. My okay. sense of it is, I really want to be around to see this happen. My sense of it is that replacing paper dollars or bank deposits that you could transfer via Venmo for, for a U.S. cryptocurrency is not where I see it going. Okay. I think it's more global than that. Oh. And I think that's because, I'm sad to say, that the dollar is lo will lose its status as the world's reserve currency. What does that mean? Well, oil's priced in dollars around the world. Soybeans are typically priced in dollars. And all commerce is priced in dollars. It's the standard. You know, there's a Big Mac standard. When I was on the board of McDonald's, you know, they priced the, I think it was the economist, used to every year come out, what's the value of each currency? How much of a Big Mac? Because the Big Mac was a standard across right. global, okay? And we've lived with our entire lifetime, the dollar is a global currency, reserve currency. But before World War II, it was the British pound sterling. And hundreds of years ago, it was Spain because they had the gold and he who had the gold rules. So it's not written in cement that the US dollar is a world reserve currency. So you asked me about a US crypto or a US mm -hmm. uh, yeah, cryptocurrency. And I personally think that it'll be a global currency because wow. we live in a global trade and that it won't be controlled by the U.S. government, and that will be the appeal of it. Otherwise, stick with dollars. That will be the appeal and also be the argument. I mean, that, you know, you're gonna, yeah. have, you're gonna have people in this country that don't wanna do that, that are, you know, aren't gonna feel comfortable um, you know, getting in financial bed with, with the rest of the world. Well, but I don't, think, I don't think there's a choice, you know, like you're saying. I don't think- yeah. I think When no one wants your dollars, you're gonna look for something that will hold value. That's what happened in 1979 and 80. I mean, I don't know if gold will come back to be it. It has for centuries, but you know, who knows? But the point is what happened when everybody realized this dollar is a piece of paper and it's buying less and less because people demand more and more because it's not worth very much. When that happens, people, you know, in 1980, farmland soared, gold obviously soared, uh, and everything else that was tangible stuff you could hold mm -hmm. soared because people didn't want paper and interest rates soared to get people to accept paper. Wow. That's, I yeah. mean, we uh, could talk, we could talk forever on that. I wanted to, to change gears and also to ask you about just some recent news where we had some, a family office, Archegos, I think was the name of it, where they lost like yeah. 20 billion overnight and come to find out family offices oh. don't have to, a report like regular financial reform, uh, firms do. And there's, it's just the wild, wild west. It used to be hedge funds were the wild, wild west and private equity was the wild, wild west. Now it's family offices. Do you have any feel for if the SEC is gonna e ever be able to get their arms around this? Because this is a new one as well, family offices. Well, sure. Look, the smart money is really smart and they figure out how to get around things. That's another t-shirt, Terry. The smart money is really smart. I think I'll print that one and wear yeah, that Yeah, that's really good. You trademark that. Okay, there you <laughs> but go. But keep going. Um, you know, I remember long-term capital management that was sort of a hedge fund and they levered up. That was what instigated the real coverage of the real uh, take, you know, financial regulation of hedge funds and so forth. Now, Gary Gensler is the new SEC chairman. I happen to know him because being on the board of CME Group, the Mercantile Exchange, he was formerly head of the Commodity Futures Trading Commission. Mm -hmm. He is a very smart man. In fact, he's a minor expert, maybe a major expert on cryptocurrencies, having taught classes in that, I think it's MIT. Okay. And um, 
I know that he knows how to look around corners, whereas previous SEC chairmen have been part of the industry. So I think you might see more creative regulation. But again, remember, there's a lot of money at stake here, and the smart money is really smart, and everybody has to be on their toes to make sure the regulations work. For the, for the individual investor with, you know, currently over 80%, whoever's keeping score, but over 80% of all trades are non-human black box, algorithmic, high velocity trades. No emotions involved, computer against computer. Um, that's just reality, and I guess it's going to even get higher. What does the small, normal, typical investor do? You know, I always say investing is a little bit like you know, um, surfing beside a cruise ship, especially if you're trading, you know, you're either going to catch a wave or get sucked under the boat. What's your opinion on, on just how technology has changed investing or if it has at all in your opinion? Well, you know, I believe in, there's a place for everybody. I remember once ages and ages ago when I was on a local TV thing and I, got, I had a guy come on and teach charting point and figure charts. And I, and I went, my goodness, uh, the, the local bookstore said, how many people are taking your course because we're sold out of the books you recommended? Um, there's a place for everything. Some people are market technicians. They look at the patterns. Some mm -hmm. people are fundamentalists. They look at real earnings. And today we're not looking at real earnings for a lot of these companies, but future revenues kinds of things. I think there's a place for everyone in the market and that diversity of people in the market. And I also know for a fact that those black boxes aren't always right. Okay, they're only as good as the programs and because the markets change, the programs get out of sync. I'm not at all intimidated by the fact that even though you're an individual and you are trading at Robinhood and they send your order to Citadel to be processed mm -hmm. and it gets processed through a computer, that's, that's part of what you consider black box, but just pure algorithm trading isn't always right all the time. Technology improves liquidity and disclosure and, I never want to complain about someone else having an edge, especially because I'm not trading for that steep of a point. If I'm going to buy a stock, I don't, I don't even try and think I'm competing against that smart money. I want to be riding along with the smart money. And, you know, I, I bought Amazon. I can't tell you how many years ago. I remember when, when I said, wait, you can buy more than books on Amazon? I remember <laughs> that moment of revelation. That's I called went, fundamental analysis, Terry. <laughs> Basic well, that's fundamental analysis. You know, buy what you know. But it was a revelation. I said, you can get this on Amazon and that. Now, for the last year and a half or whatever, I couldn't have lived without Amazon. I mean, that's how I lived. What are your readers asking you the most right now? What are their concerns? Oh, wait, I'm turning the tables on you. Hello, everybody. Ah, okay. We're going to talk annuities? I was, I, was, I was in my non-annuity lane. You're going to get me out of my non-annuity. I am. I am. Okay. I, I, I'll tell you something I'm getting. It's a perfect opportunity. Everybody listen up because there's some of you out there. You're Stan the annuity man, and you have taught me everything I know about annuities. And I own some, and I, I had bought some before I actually knew you. And because I figured I can't write about this stuff without knowing it. And if you sure. buy it and you put your own money in it, you know it. Okay. So you've helped me save a lot of people from the chicken dinner or the free lunch. Mm -hmm. Okay. I've shamelessly taken your words. You've helped me the chapters on my books. Okay. But now let's address something new. There sure. are a lot of people who bought equity linked annuities for lack of a better name. We are not talking about the wonderful uses of here I am retiring. Should I take a portion of my money and right. get a check a month for life? Well, it might not bump up because of for inflation, but wait, I'm really worried about running out of money at age 85. How about if I give a good insurance company money now and I get a check a month starting at age 80? Those, those are kind of, that's a different category. But for the last decade or so, people have gone to those chicken dinners bought these annuities that were linked at, I could give your speech, phantom indexes that don't reflect the dividends, which are 40% of the market return, Correct. point to point, but what's, all those things, they bought them, they own them. Now they are 68, 73, and they see, because we're in a bull market, that there's an account that says the equity part of my account, look how it's grown. I wasn't even smart, but I would, in this variable equity link, I put $100,000 in, it's worth $172,000. I have this other count, the base, income base, it's 
and growing at maybe 3% or 4%. What do I do now? How do I get the money out? Do I, can I take all that money out? Do I take it, uh, do I turn it into an annuity? What do I do? Stan, what are you telling those people? Because people are asking me and I'm yeah. going to write a column based on well, this. Well, everyone's situation obviously is customizable, but, right. but annuity companies have the big buildings for a reason. They design these products so that when you attach what's called an income writer, a phantom account, monopoly money that you can use to, to calculate your first income stream, that is not transferable. So you can't go from one annuity to another. Uh, one of the really bad things that's happening in the industry is, is too many agents will say, well, if you take this upfront bonus, it'll make up for the surrender charges, et cetera. That's illegal and they should lose their license, but that happens too often. Um, you know, in my world, you buy annuities for what they will do, not what they might do. That's the highest contractual guarantee. They're commodity products and we shop all carriers. But for the people that went to the bad chicken dinner seminars and not only swallowed the food, but swallowed the pitch and then, uh, and then, sw and then signed on the dotted line that it sounded too good to be true. Um, and you, if you attach an income writer, you're going to have to use that annuity for lifetime income because it's not transferable because in the annuity industry, when you transfer an annuity, you have to prove on paper in the application that the annuity you're coming from and the annuity that you're going to, the one that you're going to is better mathematically. And the companies structure these if you put a writer on them so that you can't. Okay, let me say this in my English, all right, to my, my readers. Mm -hmm. you, got an, you bought this annuity, it had a crazy index, you loved the promise that you couldn't lose money and mm -hmm. that you would get some of the market emphasis on some of the market some, upside yeah. and now you have a statement you have a statement with like two accounts on it your account your investment account that had these funds in it is the hundred thousand and let me stop you right there 99 percent of the time the accumulation value the investment side which with index and news it's a cd product okay it's not a, yeah. a security the the investment side is 99 percent of the time going to be lower than the income benefit side because the income benefit side typically is growing by this high Jimmy Carter type interest rate that you can't get to unless you turn on the income stream. So it, and typically okay. you're going to have 150,000 on the accumulation and 225,000 on the income benefit. And the and only way base. to get to wait, that wait, is wait, turn wait. on the income stream. Okay. That's what I want to say. I can't call up today and say, now I want my 225,000. No. Okay. How can I get, the money that's in that two hundred and twenty-five thousand dollar account. Explain you have to turn for on not. the lifetime. You have to turn on the lifetime income stream. But that to annuitize, or is that no. to take withdrawals? No. no, the majority of of income riders, and I've written a book on that. You can go to my site and get the income yes. rider owners manual. But the the majority of income riders are what's called withdrawal products, meaning you're not annuitizing them. Annuitizing them in Southern speak is ripping the knob off a water faucet and water <laughs> flowing. In this case, it's income. Um, it's not annuitization. There's only one income writer type that's an annuitized product and it's attached to a variable annuity and they're, they're really not sold that much anymore. The majority of income writers are what I call subtraction products. There's a lifetime income stream, but you're going to be subtracting from the income writer value and the accumulation value. But getting to your original question, which is how do I get the value out? How do I get that yes. entire value out? The only way, the only way is to turn on a lifetime income stream. And that lifetime income stream is primarily going to be based on your life expectancy of single life or life expectancies of joint life at the time you take the payment and you're 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 making a bet with the annuity company that is going to pay for the rest of your life but here's the interesting part about your wait, question wait, let me stop you wait, people let me are buying you. these things and they don't know what they own i know that's what i'm trying to tell people so now the question is First of all, what you get to take out every year is determined by the insurance company based on their calculations of what you have interest rates and your life expectancy. Life expectancy. So they say, the Gary, yeah. you can take uh, $1,200 $1, a month out of this thing. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I say, but wait, I really would like to take more right now because I want to buy a vacation home. But they don't let you do that. Yeah, they, they do. But you can take it out. You can take it out, but it's going to be deducted not only from the accumulation value, that index side, uh -huh. but also the income writer side. So it will affect the guarantee. Okay. Now, the next question is, so they tell me it's $1,200 a month at this age. If you wait to be 75, it'll be $1,400 a month, whatever it might be. Sure. Okay. So you now have to, at some point, all these people who bought these things, and want income mm -hmm. have to say, 
what age do I turn this on? Should I do this at 65? Should I do this at 70, at 75? How eerily, do you make that? eerily familiar to a social security decision, right? Yeah. It Except really social is. security is going to adjust with a COLA and your check. Correct. Probably. Correct. Just people need to understand the older you are, the higher the payment. It's not that, it's not that. Right. And, and you're transferring risk, but there's no sweet spot or good time or perfect time. The time is okay. when you, the contractual guarantee makes sense for you. But I'll add, add one, one more thing and then we got to stop talking about annuities. People are going to okay. jump out of the building. But folks, Aries. I loved it. Okay, but this is this is my yeah. <laughs> just people. Most people that own index annuities with income riders, and this is a sad stat. They never turn on the income rider. They lo They look. They watch it. They see that high percentage that it's growing by. They think it's Jimmy Carter yield. They think it's something that it's not. It's monopoly money unless you use it for income. Unless you turn on the income stream. So my advice wow. to all your 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 readers and listeners is, don't watch it. Don't just look at the statement. Transfer that risk and turn on that pension income stream. Because the interesting part about, and, and maybe this is what your readers talk about as well, we live in a pensionless world. Unless you work for the government or very good, um, uh, you know, a very good labor union and less than 10% of private companies offer pensions, the, the rest of us have to create our own pension. And that's truly the unique benefit proposition of annuities. It's the only product that can, that can provide lifetime income. And truly that's where people should be using them. And there's four different types of annuities for that. But I mean, I, I think we're maxing out on the annuities. People are throwing, I can hear them and see them throwing up, Terry. They, All right, I'm sorry, they, they, they want to hear what you, they want to hear about your right, experiences right. in the market, Read but I appreciate column it. And I'll milk stand for the advice. Okay, I'll go, go on ahead. your podcast and we'll talk about annuities. All right, okay. <laughs> so um, what else is, what else is kind of a hot topic with your, in the markets with your readers um, and your listeners? and people that contact you when you go on TV and radio. What, what are you hearing currently that you think can apply to people across the board? Okay, well, maybe not across the board, but you're not gonna expect this kind of response and we didn't plan this. I think the next hot topic is long-term care and okay. long-term insurance. Because um, it was always okay to put mom into assisted living and if you had enough money. Now, even people who can, pay for assisted living, just learned that's not a really great place to be. Right. You, you remember everybody's mother said, honey, don't put me in a home. <laughs> now we, this generation learned why. Yeah. But the Genworth just came out with its cost of care. I mean, it's like over $150,000 to have a year to have full-time home health care. Probably won't need it for that long, but long-term care insurance has been the most maligned product and duly and justly so. I had everybody buy it. 15 years ago, and I said, and buy it when you're in your 50s, when you're younger, the price is lower. <clears throat> Excuse me, they're not gonna raise the rates just because you broke your hip. They'd have to raise the rates on a whole class of people, everybody who bought that policy back in 1997. Well, guess what the insurance companies did? Raise they looked the around and said, wait, everybody wants to use their long-term care insurance to go into assisted living. Those places are so nice these days, they have shuffleboard too. And so they said, <laughs> Where the usage is not what was much more than we expected. We'll raise the rates at every state commissioner granted a rate increase because they said, we're going to go out of business if you don't grant us a rate increase. I fought that battle with the state of Illinois. How could you do this? You know, and the worst part of long-term care insurance is not just that premiums have been rising on those older policies, but what happens if you don't use it? I mean, you know, you're 89, you have a hole in one on the golf course and you drop dead. But that's a good way to go. That's the, those are the, that's the traditional policy. But as we discussed, but, it, yeah, it, there's some good ones out there now. Now they have combination policies that combine long-term care and death benefits. I want, you can Google that on terrysavage.com, search my columns. But the point I'm making is I think we have the, the trailing edge of the baby boom generation. All baby boomers, I think, in two years will be 65. Mm -hmm. And so we're suddenly having this realization that you don't want to be in a Medicare nursing home if you spend down all your money or give it away to your kids and they'll look back to make sure it wasn't recently. You don't want to be in a Medicare, a Medicaid funded nursing home. Medicare mm -hmm. doesn't cover nursing home costs, Medicaid, your sure. state program. You don't even want to be in the nicest assisted living facility. Maybe they're having a lot of vacancies that everybody who could took mom out and put them in the guest room. So wouldn't you like to be able to pay for care at home? And that's what a combination mm -hmm. life long term care policy. And I think that's going to be a coming hot topic. Then maybe I agree. It, and if you're all if you're too young out there and you say, whoa, is she an old lady? Why is she talking about that? Forget me. Think about your mother. 
Yeah. Are you going to want to pay for her home health care? Right. Mother's Day, Father's Day. Well, Father's Day is coming. That's a great present. Get your parents a long-term care insurance policy. All the brothers and sisters chip in. That way you, your mom won't be living in your spare room just when you're ready to go out and have fun. And I just recently taped a, a, a segment, a podcast with the number one long-term care person in the country. His, oh. name is Jack, his name's Jack Lindenberg. And he was, he was going through all of this and, and echoed exactly what you said. What people need to understand, and there's, there's, a, there's misinformation on the long-term care side that's equivalent to the misinformation on the annuity side. But people need to understand that with the, what they call asset-based policies, you can, you can have the coverage, but if you don't use the coverage, then the money goes back to your, um, you know, your to aunt. your list of beneficiaries. The same fear that people have with lifetime income annuities. Well, I'm not going to ever buy an annuity stand because the evil annuity company is going to keep the money when I die. That's just one of 40 different ways to structure it. So what people need to understand is this isn't having your cake and eat it too. It's having the benefit in place if needed. Exactly. And if you don't need it, then the money goes back. So you're really, what you're missing out on, 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 asset-based long, asset long-term care or a lifetime income annuity, you're missing out on FOMO, fear of missing out the, the opportunity, the next Tesla, the next Dodge coin, you're transferring risk. And I think in everyone's portfolio, they should be, a portion of it should be risk transfer, whether that risk transfers for income, long-term care or principal protection, those are all risk transfers. Now with, with 10,000, babe, go ahead. And that's priceless, Stan, because if you're younger out there and you think you don't get what, what's, no, I'm going to take risk. The price of peace of mind when you're in your 60s or 70s or 80s, I'm sure, is priceless. I mean, priceless. Don't worry, honey. They can't kick us out of our house. Don't worry. We've got long-term care insurance. Don't worry. We can spend this because our kid's going to get the insurance or they'll get the rest of the annuity because we've got a death benefit on it price of sleeping well at night, priceless. Well, and with 10,000 baby boomers reaching the age of 65 every single day, what we have seen, and we've been having record years because we sell contractual guarantees, those 10,000 people every day, a lot of them want contractual guarantees. A lot of them want to establish what I call the income floor, which is your social security, an annuity payment, a pension if you're so fortunate, dividends from dividend stocks if you're so fortunate. That monthly amount that comes in every single month so that you can go live your life and have the lifestyle that you've earned and deserve for chapter two of your life. That's where that all fits in. But I'm the first one to say that you have to have things in the market. You have to follow people like Terry Savage and the annuity industry totally agrees. And not a lot of people know this, Terry, but the annuity industry frowns upon anyone putting more than 50% of their investable assets. That's not a house car, that's investable assets into annuities of any type and there's seven or more different types of annuities. So when people call me up and say, you know, I just had a, a call this morning where a gentleman said, you know, I have this IRA, I want to put it all into annuity. I said, we can't do that. Oh, there are agents that want to do that, but legally, morally, ethically, and from a fiduciary approach, one half of your investable assets is, is all that the annuity companies feel comfortable with. They're trying to protect the consumer with that. Um, so I, I don't know if people know that. I don't know if your listeners know that, but I think that's a stat that needs to be shouted from the mouth. That's a great one. I mean, yeah. to me, it's obvious. It's a oh, portion. Yes. A portion. Yes. But I mean, the idea that you would lock up all your money in this way is ridiculous because I started out by saying, you know, the stock market has always beaten inflation. So even if you're 77 or 83, you need some portion of your assets in a Maybe it's an equity income fund. I'm not telling you to go out running, decide whether Tesla or sure. Facebook or Amazon are too high or too low. But just buy an equity income fund because you need that boost, that protection of, against inflation that comes from equities. It's, it's all about Definitely. diversification. Now, see, I don't sell anything. I've never sold anything except back a zillion years ago when I was a mini-skirted stockbroker. Um, <laughs> I still I have nothing to gain. I don't endorse any products or any company's products. We're unlike you in a way that we really out there to help educate and sure. protect consumers. And you and you've done a you're doing a great job, done a great job of that, which leads me to the final question. We have maxed out. We've done it. I mean, this is I could talk to you forever, as I always do. Sometimes when Terry comes to Florida, I'll drive down and take her to lunch so we can have a long right. conversation. But um, what's in store for Terry Savage? What's what tell are, are you just going to keep helping people 
till the end of the day or tell me what's happening with you. What's your plan? Well, I thank God every day that I'm in a position to help. Um, at terrysavage.com, I have an Ask Terry blog. And because of the media around the country, I, I mean, I stay up late nights trying to answer all these questions. And, sure. and lately, for the last two years, I think it was so helpful, uh, was about unemployment benefits and, and identity theft, which is another huge stuff yeah. we didn't hit on, and um, uh, stimulus payments and so on and so forth. Those questions keep rolling in, along with the kinds of questions that people ask in general about money. I am so fortunate to be where I am at this point, and I just I'm knocking on wood on my desk here. I want to keep doing it. And by the way, technology has made it so much easier because no yeah. matter where I am, Definitely. I can do that. And and I'm going to reveal something that I have never ever before revealed um, to any of my readers. Okay, great. You know how all, this is true only to you because I feel like we're sitting over lunch. <laughs> you know how all those great creatures of virtue, I mean, have a secret vice. You know, you've seen the headlines. Sure. Tammy Faye Baker, all the, you know, and the, the young girls or whatever it is. I am the preacher of financial virtue. But my secret vice, my hobby forever, my cheaper than a psychiatrist is, I own horses mm -hmm. and I ride all the time. And I'm gonna take this jacket off in about a half an hour and go ride my horse. And that is the dumbest investment in the world. As a commodity trader once said to me, my goodness gracious, you go short on oats and you come out long horse manure, terrible spread. <laughs> so I have my own vices too, and I've never told that to anyone. But, and I think people need to have whatever they call it, the side hustle or something that really, that's, because that's, yeah. you can't be all markets all markets all the time, exactly. but um, you know, certainly we're going to have you back on and we're going to, you know, I wanted my listeners and they know who you are, but I want them to get to know you a little bit better before we then in the future go into some really deep topics. And, um, but, but it's always been a pleasure. Once again, for everybody, you can go to terrysavage.com. That's T-E-R-R-Y-S-A-V-A-G-E.com. And you can ask her a question. And by the way, she answers it. And you can see that Warren Buffett interview with her friend, Warren Buffett. So, I mean, She's financial royalty, um, the money lady. You can call her whatever you want, but, but she's also a very good person. And the biggest thing that I like about her is she doesn't sell anything, but if there's ever anyone that was, would ever be called a fiduciary, meaning putting people's interests in front of their own, it's Terry Savage. You don't have to just sell something to be a fiduciary. Terry Savage is a fiduciary looking out for the consumer, and she has been helping people for decades. And... God willing, she'll be helping people for decades to come. And with that being said, I want to thank everybody for joining me on Fun with Annuities. Terry Savage, thank you so much. Thank and you. We'll That's the nicest thing I've ever been called, Stan, a fiduciary. A fiduciary. Excellent. Well, we'll see everybody next week on Fun with Annuities. Thanks for listening to Fun with Annuities. Please hit the subscribe button and make sure to go to my site, at theannuityman.com, where you can run your own SPIA, DIA, and QLAC quotes and see a live feed of the best MIGA fix rates in the country and even get indexed and income rider quotes as well. You can also sign up for my six annuity owner's manual books and I'll ship them for free and under no obligation. I also encourage you to schedule a one-on-one -on -one call with me, Stan the Annuity Man, so we can have a full discussion of your specific situation. It will be the best brutally factual and truthful advice you will ever get. And that's one guarantee you should definitely take advantage of. So join me next time for the number one annuity podcast on the planet, Fun with Annuities.